Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ryan Bijan, host of Cowtown Movie Classics, and welcome to the inaugural conversation in our Holidays at Horace Hall series. First off, very special thanks to Horace Hall for having us here in December. They're awesome. We love you guys. I know there's been a lot of controversy in the last few weeks, but Cowtown Movie Classics ain't going nowhere, so we are here to stay. Tonight, we are celebrating a very unconventional Christmas film, if you want to call it that. It is a truly gripping thriller, a very stylistic noir, one of the greatest suspense films, maybe even horror films ever made, directed by legendary actor and stage performer Charles Lawton. This was the only film he ever made as a director, and it's certainly gone down in history as one of the greats. From 1955, the Night of the Hunter. And tonight we're welcoming back film historian, producer, and great pal, the Cowtown Movie Classics. Pet, pet owner. And pet owner, yeah. Mr. Mr. Dan Marino. How's it going, Dan? It's going very well, Ryan. Thank you for uh, having me as always. And yes, pick quite a, quite a great film to kick off the, uh, this inaugural December season with. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Now, there's so there's so many points to unpack. This is such a wonderful film on on many technical levels, on many uh, emotional levels. It's just one of these great all around classic essential films. But I know it's one of your personal favorite movies of all time. Why is that? That is correct, Ryan. And uh, I made a top 10 list of films that were my uh, top 10 favorite now that is at least uh, at least 15 years old. And I, I constantly go back to it. And I always say to myself, you know, I'm happy to say it, it, it in many ways remains. I have not had to revise my top 10. The 10 films in there, of which this is one, um, you know, absolutely uh, have remained on there for me. So I've, it's, it's kind of been... Uh, neat for me that they have, have maintained their residence and as such this is a film that i have seen many you know many many times over the years one of my all-time favorites so so what is it i mean i'm sure that's an honored slot but like what is it about night of the hunter that speaks to you as a film fan the top 10 films i have on that list are something that for me that all kind of adhere to what i think is cinema at its best really and what cinema has the ability to do that is is perhaps better than any other medium of the arts, which is that at its greatest, it can truly depict life as a dream. It can take the, the logic and the ephemeral qualities of dreams themselves, the mystery of dreams themselves, and restructure reality in a way where we experience everything that we experience in the day to day through you know fresh eyes, where we experience it in a sort of dream logic. And uh, and in this sense, you know, one of the things that Night of the Hunter is, is it's certainly that by every, uh, you know, estimation. It's also, I would say, a fairy tale and, a, and a, a gothic fairy tale at that. And that is one of the other things that cinema, you know, is perhaps other than literature and arguably better than literature actually does quite well, which is that it is able to truly tell a fairy tale, uh, I think, in a way that it, it really captures the magic that you know, is implied by when we read it from a book, but, you know, it is rarely as, as perfect and as magical as when we see it depicted on screen. It can really weave a spell in that way. Um, and uh, and then, you know, as I say before, this kind of also taps into something I kind of like, love about America. And, you know, the term Southern Gothic is an extremely well-known term, but this film, you know, is, is truly a Southern Gothic film in that respect. Uh, and, you know, the... <clears throat> I think it was Devendra P. Varma who wrote a very uh, important book on Gothic literature called The Gothic Flame. And his definition was my favorite of it, which was that, you know, the Gothic is the surrealistic expression of those historical and social factors which the ordinary chronicle of events in history does not consider significant. And, you know, this film completely embodies that in a Southern Gothic sense. It is a, a fairy tale of the Depression. And really, that Depression is what stood out to me this time watching it again. Uh, and, it, and it really reveals it in a way that is, uh, you know, everything that cinema is supposed to be. But is there, are there any specific points, if there's anyone in the audience watching this film for the first time, is there anything they should keep their eye out for? 
Oh, well, I mean, you know, I think, you know, what, the thing I'll add to it maybe, which is a better addendum, is that uh, that for me is kind of why it's on there. But the other reasons that, uh, you know, you just said it's a very interesting Christmas film. And I, I, I uncovered in this particular uh, re reviewing everything for this particular screening, you know, the, the final sequence of the film uh, truly is, uh, uh, you know, delves into really Christmas territory. And it is meant to actually, as Charles Lawton envisioned it, almost feel like a Christmas present that has arrived and we're kind of opening the package is kind of what the idea of that final sequence is. And, you know, what, what another thing, because of, as you said, it's, it's truly one of the great horror films, uh, one of the great performances by one of the great actors of all time, Robert Mitchum. And uh, he may never have been better than in this performance and directed, as you said, by one of the maybe greatest actor of the 20s and, and the 40s, you know, in my mind, rivaled maybe only by James Cagney uh, for very different reasons. And so you could very easily leave it with Charles Lawton. You know, you have an interest, and then written by James Agee, who for people I also have to say were not familiar with film criticism, is, you know, one of the great film critics. And uh, while his uh, tenure on this in relationship with Lawton was very troubled, I think much of his script, it seems, still survives to an extent. Uh, so, you know, I think the last thing you're going to see, which is a good thing to keep your eye on, is is that this is often thought of as a horror film. But what makes it work as a horror film is I think it is really truly one of cinema's top five or ten depictions of childhood uh, and children is the centrifugal theme, I think, of the film and the innocence of children and how that survives in the world you know and so easy to miss it with all of the scary things and the great performance of robert mitchum but uh i think it's 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 worth it to keep it in mind that this is a a fable about depicting the inner life of a child all right dan well thank you so much if you're in the audience please stick around to hear the rest of our conversation if you've seen this movie before you know there's a lot to unpack without further ado from 1955 the night of the hunter Wow, what an incredible film. An amazing movie. I'm, one, as always, jealous that I'm not there in person to share it with you. But you're with us in spirit, and that's what we appreciate. That is correct. I, I, I am with you in the, the spirit there. I'm a ghost haunting the Cowtown cinemas. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> this you, moment, a cinematic ghost, yes. You're a ghost of Christmas past. That's why you have the glow behind you, right? You're that's right, exactly. The, the, there you go, exactly. So it's almost incomprehensible to conceive of today, but this movie was not well received by neither audiences or critics in 1955. Why was that? What was the reception like? Well, that's, you know, always an interesting question, uh, you know, and, you know, you, you point out something that I've always been troubled by as a, as a filmmaker and a producer myself, which is that most of the films, actually, that we end up uh, looking at today that really is really the great ones, the classics, uh, at a minimum, it seems like, in general, get a mixed reception upon their release. Uh, it's rare, uh, historically, if you actually really look at the record, in my opinion, that um, something that we hold in high esteem was genuinely praised as such on its arrival. It's a rare phenomenon, actually, that it is. And usually the things that are praised highly in that way, uh, you know, while again, they might, you know, that might not be inaccurate to praise them and they're of a high quality, are not necessarily the films we're talking about today. Uh, and I've always found it troubling, you know, th those factors when you think about it. So it's it's certainly no, uh, no, no, uh, you know, negative, uh, it's, it, it, there is certainly not a shadow it's hanging under the fact that it was not received at this time. It was probably quite ahead of its time. I think there's a couple, you know, reasons and factors it might. I mean, it's easy to forget when we watch a movie like this. I think I usually forget it. Uh, that this was made in 1955, uh, that it was, it was, uh, uh, or 54, I think. And it was, you know, at this point, black and white was well on its way out. I mean, color had been, uh, invented in the late mid to early 30s, you had color, you know what I mean? So, you know, I think we always forget this, I think when we as cinema goers watch these films, you know, that color and black and white existed neck and neck for almost 20 years. So, you know, we sort of think of them as, as segmented periods, but at this point in time, a, a black and white film was an extremely tough sell for your general, you know, audience in a way. Um, you know, not impossible, of course, there are examples, but, you know, it was already kind of on the way out. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot about the film that is 
you know, very ahead of its time. Uh, you know, it was often as we were just saying about critics, you know, uh, James Agee sadly passed away before it was released. But uh, many people said that was probably a blessing because the way he'd been, uh, you know, criticizing everybody else as a critic, they would have really piled on were he alive. But he was kind of he was kind of spared that uh, <laughs> with uh, his passing, I suppose. It was truly a cult film as time went on. It was one of those genuine films that had, you know, clubs that would meet around Night of the Hunter just to screen Night of the Hunter and talk about Night of the Hunter. Uh, it was, you know, even as early as the the 60s and not even 10 years after its relief, release viewed uh, as a highly, highly, uh, you know, praised film, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, and a classic part of the canon already and, and very much. Uh, you know, a, a cult film in the truest sense of the word that has risen in popularity with, you know, wildly enthusiastic fans over the years. Yeah. So I wonder, do you think part of the criticism might be attributed to, we mentioned earlier, this was directed by Charles Lawton. Unfortunately, he was so discouraged by this criticism, we were robbed of ever seeing another Charles Lawton directed film again. But yeah. If you're in our audience as a Cowtown Movie Classics regular, you know, we've seen him in The Sign of the Cross, The Island of Lost Souls. And I mean, he went on to do so many other greater, bigger things, uh, but he was such a tremendous talent. But do you think maybe some of this, do you feel like some of the critics maybe saw it as a vanity project? Like, oh, who does Charles Lawn think, think he is? He's going to come and try to direct a film. Were they trying to knock him down a peg? Well, you know, there might be something to say, uh, there could possibly be something to say with respect to that, as I think, um, uh, in the sense that he's certainly a, a you know a British director coming in and depicting a time in America that you know was not anything he'd lived, and I think you know that taps into one of the reasons that I also quite like the film. I think you know there's something about we we tend to think of art and artists um, as something that is associative with lived experience, life experience, you know, all of that. But, you know, there's a, there's a quality to what I would call the alien, uh, the, the, the person coming in with fresh eyes, you know, kind of looking at something, um, you know, through a lens that other people don't, that we really actually see things truly as they are frequently uh, in the world of the arts. And, you know, there's really, you know, fewer, greater examples of this in the cinematic canon, I think, that, you know, Charles Lawton seemed to understand, in my opinion, something so intrinsic about America, so intrinsic about America during that period of the Great Depression. Uh, it takes someone who's kind of standing on the outside looking in to maybe completely crisp. And perhaps that was part of the reason there's a sort of hubris in that how could he have that? And then I think there's also something to be said about the fact that, you know, as weird as it is to say, uh, the, the type of filmmaking that it is was kind of already on the way out, you know, we're starting to see verisimilitude break in in a much, much, you know, more aggressive way by this point in time. I mean, you know, I believe on the waterfront, it had, I don't know if it had come out or it was coming on. You know, I mean, people were beginning to get used to, you know, uh, reality creeping into Hollywood much more than this film is, you know? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Around that time, that gritty realism was coming in. But it, it's interesting, this movie is, it's a movie made in 1955, and you can tell that Charles Lawton was a student of German Expressionism, with his, his very high ceilings, these very stylized sets. It really, it certainly does feel like an outlier for its era. But I want to yeah. talk a little bit about uh, the novel by Davis Grubb. What was it about this material that spoke to Lawton? Well, I think, you know, that's a great question. I, I mean, we've not, no one's ever really... You know, Simon Callow, if everyone is familiar with the actor, probably has written the definitive and most fantastic book on uh, Charles Lawton and his biography. And, and Simon Callow has made a bit of a mission in kind of uh, being his biographer, being the person who's really been his, his, his cha champion, is one of the great screen actors of all time. Um, you know, I think that's a great question. I don't, I don't know that I know. I think there's an element of that. You know, I, I could perhaps say it one of the better ways of saying it is I, I found a fabulous article that an interview with Stanley Cortez, the DP, uh, who it's, you know, it briefly I'll say as well from this article was I think a huge part of, of the film being as great as it was, I think in the, uh, in its making. Um, because, you know, Charles Lawton did not have a lot of these technical experience, but Stanley Cortez worked with him on a movie before. And I, you know, I can't quite recall, but he, they had, they had discussed the nature of some shots and it was near the Eiffel Tower, it was on the Eiffel Tower. 
And uh, he said at that moment in time, Stanley Cortez said he'd given we'd, we discussed some shots and he was just an actor in that film. But he said it occurred to me that that Charles could be a great director because he had a way of seeing Paris, you know, you know, better than even the Parisians, you know, in a way that was more French than even the Parisians, you know. And in a sense, that's kind of what a director is meant to do. I think Charles Lawton probably, uh, I, you know, sometimes these things were more work for hire in Hollywood. Uh, he probably, I, I, I don't know whether he selected the book or found his way into the material once he had gotten it. But um, what I do know is that Stanley Cortez worked very closely with him and felt the need to be very protective of Charles in this time. And then they would, because he, he you know, didn't have the technical knowledge. So he, he, he wanted to make sure that the team and everyone around him, you know what I mean, was, was, had a, was, really not taking advantage or misappropriating his not but you know misappropriating his lack of experience but as orson wells you know uh said in his famous uh you know working on citizen kane with greg toland you know he said uh you know I, when i wanted to make films and he said it since you know greg toland came over and said listen you know if you, he, said, he said tell me everything about filmmaking and he said well listen you know everything you need to know about filmmaking i can show you in a day you know what i mean <laughs> and uh and, you know, I mean, it's, it's telling it really matter. And indeed he did that. He gave him a crash course in the camera, how it works, how you use it, how you adjust it. Um, and, you know, Charles Lawton kind of slept in like a fish in water, never having done it. And that's, again, why we lament, I think, not having more. And indeed, though, you know, I think it's often framed as that the reception maybe scared him away from doing it. You know, he was in preparation, I think, to do The Naked and the Dead with Stanley Cortez uh, when he passed away. Um, or he dropped out for one reason or another, because he, he passed away not too long after this. So, you know, I think it was certainly a blow to his confidence, but it, it seemed like, you know, I, I think if he'd been around longer, we would probably have had uh, a bit more, uh, maybe more films from him. You know, I, th I think that, uh, you know, he seemed to have, you know, bucked up and tried to get back in the swing of things. You know, briefly, I'll go back to one of the things we were saying about reality creeping in. You know, when method acting and all of this and really the street, you know, more realistic acting crept in, everyone had a lot to say about it. But it speaks so much to what was great to him as a performer. And ironically, I was citing, you know, my three favorite actors. Or, you know, There's a few others, but really, if you, you know, putting it to my head, I love James Cagney. I love Charles Lawton. And then Robert Mitchum, who came shortly after, is really, I think, one of the great screen stars of all time as well. Um, you know, they all sort of had some uh problems with with verisimilitude uh you know james cagney is not a realistic actor but he's a star in every sense of the word it's you know every moment feels like it's being played to you know a, a, a giant theater full of every you know but uh charles lawton said of this and i think this says a lot actually about the film night of the hunter but he said a method actor can give you a photograph a real actor can give you an oil painting you know, and in and in a way, I think that is really goes right to the heart of what uh, you know, Night of the Hunter is, which was already kind of becoming out of fashion by that time. But you know, through the eyes of time and history, we see you know what an oil painting he made. You know, oh, yeah, absolutely. From the man that played Rembrandt, right? So he knew what things exactly. Were about yeah, right. Oil painting. Yes. Um, is there anything else you wanted to, any other points? You wanted well, to there's so much I could continue on. Yeah, I mean, look, I, but I, I also know we have limited time to some degree. But, you know, I think a couple other things worth mentioning is, as I was saying before, presenting life as a dream. You know, what's so important about that to me, and I think this is, I, I always want to distinguish this, and this is more just me as a critic. You know, the, the best things, though, frequently, what is the mistake we, we make in, in cinema is that it begins as a fantasy, you know, um, and we're using, you know, we're, we're, we're using fantasy to create a sort of reality in the screen. And that is interesting to see. But to me, the best fairy tales, the true best cinema is it's using the building blocks of life itself to create a fantasy. It's the it's the act of creating a fantasy using real material. What I love about this film in particular is that it is using real uh, materials. Um, it is really actually using real life emotionality, real life experiences that, and use that to somehow reimagine it through the lens of a fairy tale. But none of it is, 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 is fake. You know, I think it's all real. When I say Southern Gothic, you know, the, the film takes on all of the tropes sociologically of the South of that world of the time and reimagines them through a lens that 
feels approachable, that feels heightened, but approachable, but it all is real. You know, the Shelley, Shelley Winters kind of indoctrination. And then most importantly, I think it, a word has to be said about Robert Mitchum's performance. And, you know, I always think too, you know, Robert Mitchum was one of the great actors, but always tried to minimize the, 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 the pretension that surrounded art. But I think, you know, always tried to minimize the down talk himself downplay himself as an actor always tried to make him seem like just a journeyman just a guy's guy but the reality is i think he took it quite seriously those doors i just think he felt it very unbecomely to have to talk about art in a sort of high fashion the way most people did but you know he, he often said of himself the only difference between me and my fellow actors is the time i've spent in jail <laughs> and uh, and I've, that I've spent more time in prison than all of them. And, you know, I, I think that says a lot about the performance he created. You know, uh, Harry Powell is truly, uh, you know, one of the cinema's great angelic killers in that he, he really feels like an angel, uh, even though he is a devil. And, you know, the, the, the act, the character is so convinced in his own mind of his, you know, not, you know, lack of evil, I think that it's truly what's scary about it. He, he considers himself innocent of any of this wrongdoing. And I think that Robert Mitchum spent a lot of time around these types of characters in this world and in prison. And I think he understood uh, a, a certain truth about some of the, the, the more evil people of this world and that, you know, everybody's coming from somewhere and they all have their reasons. And in their minds, they always think of themselves as the hero of their own story, you know? And that never comes true more clearly than with Harry Powell. I mean, the other, one of cinema's other great angelic killers that comes to mind really on the, only one on the same level is probably um, Harry Lyme in The Third Man, played by Orson Welles, you know, who seems like such a charming presence, is such a, a sweet presence, you know? But, you know, it was also, Charles Lawton even said of, of, Rob, of Robert Mitchum on it that, you know, all that tough talk is blind on his part. He's a very literate, gracious, kind man. Indeed, he was given much credit for working with the children um, on the film, which Charles Lawton felt he had a very difficult time with. But Robert Mitchum found a great way working in with them as kind of a sort of, you know, father figure, kind of getting them their a level of comfortability with all of the performers. But uh, he said he speak, you know, Charles Lawton said he speaks beautifully when he wants to, and that Bob would have made the best Macbeth of any other actor living. You know, he would have been a, a fantastic. And, and, you know, I always think of that. We never got to see him as that. But, uh, you know, I, I think of that as a very, uh, you know, apt description of really the type that Robert Mitchum was. There was a sophistication there that he, he hid quite frequently under the... Uh, the, the guys of that, you know, and, you know, the last thing I, I want to add this too, and it might be a bit of a non sequitur, but I know that our time is limited. I, I found a beautiful story that Stanley Cortez had about the working with uh, Robert Mitchum on this. And uh, let me just pull it up here if I may, but he was talking about how they sort of developed a shorthand and uh, you know, it was kind of like a, uh, uh, oh, I thought I had it up here, actually, but I might have <laughs> it was had a shorthand, basically. And uh, what it what it essentially was is that, you know, in any creative process, you know, I was shocked to discover that this was something that they had to shoot on a, on a schedule. This was done in 36 days and uh, they had a lot they had to try and get in. There was much in a way they were unhappy with. Uh, when they were doing it. But, you know, it was uh, like, in, indeed, they spoke about how the uh, the sequence on the stairwell, which I've always think of as one of the scariest sequences, they felt that they had to make quite a few compromises in the way that they had to figure that out because of limited time. And we'll never know really what it was supposed to be, but it's always mindful to remember that all great art is made under a kind of pressure, including this one. And, uh, but, oh yes, and, and I'd found where, what I was looking for really, which was that, uh, you know, it, it just speaks, I love this because it's just so goes to the heart of the creative process. He was saying, you know, I'm a devoted student of music. This was Stanley Cortez saying that. So while Charles was rehearsing with Bob, I was making certain preparations. Charles sat down and started to watch me and he said, Stanley, what the hell are you doing? And I said, none of your damn business, Lawton. Uh, and a, in a nice way, of course, but he insisted. And I said, Charles, I happen to be thinking of a piece of music right now. And he said in his typical Lawton way, and pray, may I ask what the music is? And I said, it's called Valsa Triste. You know, I'm, that, that's the, you know, that, and I'm saying that incorrectly, but he said, and then there was a long pause. And then Charles Lawton said, damn it, how right you are. It has to be a waltz. 
And, uh, you know, he and that was leading up to the sequence with uh, Shelley Winters in the car underwater, which is really one of the more most haunting sequences of the film and in cinema history and that they were particularly proud of. But he was saying that they somehow got a, a sense that it had to feel almost like the camera play, the music. It was a bit of a waltz during that going on to create that elegaic haunting quality. Um, so, you know, just felt I had to share that last little story there because I had not heard it myself till this point. And it speaks to so much with the creative processes. We as critics so often try to break down the conversations that people have when they're making these things, but the process itself is usually very rigorous, very involved. There's very little time for these kind of considerations. And usually it's intuitive and you kind of just go with the intuition. Yeah, well, they certainly had a good sense of intuition on this project, and they yeah. certainly created a haunting waltz. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. So, Dan, once again, thank you so much for your time. We always enjoy hearing from you. Always a pleasure to uh, talk to you guys and to your audience, and uh, hope everyone is, has a wonderful holiday season that does not resemble the children's holiday season in this film. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not, but it's 2023. You never know, right? Never know. That is true. All right. Thank you so much. And for you in the audience, I really hope you enjoyed tonight's film. We will be back this Friday with another unconventional Christmas classic. We'll be welcoming back David Del Val to hear his thoughts on Bell, Book, and Candle. So it'll be a very witchy Christmas. A treat. Day. I know it will be. It will be. Absolutely. Once again, I'm Ryan Bijan. We'll see you next time.